Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, welcome, my friends, to Easter Sunday, in which we get to encounter probably the height of Isaiah's eschatology, namely Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9. The wealth for preaching here almost exceeds our imagination. And it ties in, obviously, wonderfully both for the Easter reading, the resurrection of our Lord, but also I would encourage you to consider this text for your preaching for funerals. This is a text in my own pastoral ministry has been a, a personal favorite when I've been graveside with various congregation members because it preaches and proclaims this message of Yahweh's victory, of our victory over death, in a way that is almost more vivid than any other text of the Old Testament. So welcome to what is an absolute joy to encounter, although because it is Isaiah, I should give it a bit of a warning label, uh, namely Isaiah 25, especially verse 6. If your Hebrew might be slightly rusty, but I'm sure that's not completely the case, uh, it's going to give you a bit of a run for your money. Isaiah's Hebrew is somewhat tough here. Uh, that said, let's jump into this text and see all of this wealth of possibilities. It starts out easy enough. Ba'asa Yahweh Tzaba'oth, and Yahweh Tzaba'oth will make. This word Tzaba'oth, uh, we've seen in our liturgy, holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth. This is the word that denotes and connotes Yahweh, our Lord, as the general of heaven's armies. And this is key here. This isn't just, this is your divine warrior image who is bringing about a victory. He will make and note who comes. For Isaiah, this is actually somewhat surprising, although we've had allusions to it way back in Isaiah chapter 2. Lakol amim, all the peoples. We've seen all the peoples already in Isaiah 2, for example. But now here, they're all being welcomed to the banquet. This is Isaiah in universal scope. And not only are they invited, but it's a Bahar Hazah on this mountain. If you recall from Isaiah, and you should, is that Isaiah loves his Zion theology. And here we have a cosmic mountain in play. It's where heaven and earth meet. If you think about every mountain you bump into in the text, these are places where Yahweh acts decisively to save. Going all the way back to the rivers that flow out of Eden, the mountain of Genesis 12, culminating in the mountain of Revelation 21. Okay. We're feeling great about our Hebrew, time to get winged by Isaiah. When you look at this next expression, note his poetry is absolutely amazing. So take a look at every shin that you have. Shin, 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 za. The sa, 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 and the za uh, gives us this flowing, abundant quality of the sound. Uh, that said, the language gets somewhat difficult here. First word is easy enough. Uh, mishta, uh, shita, if you recall, is the word for drink. It's a drinking feast. Not only is it any drinking feast, it's an extraordinary one indeed. A feast of shamanim, of fatness. A feast of, and this is where, if you start even reading the Septuagint and other translations, uh, frankly, the Hebrew gets a little on the obscure side. A shamar has the means typically drags here probably the best of the stuff. And then not only is it just, so it's a feast of the drags well refined and a feast of, and here full of marrow of drags well purified is typically how this expression is rendered. Uh, that said, while it may be obscure, a couple things to focus in on. First of all, note the word shita is important. A uh, shita to drink, this is a drinking feast. And by drinking feast, this connects us to this theme of wine that is pervasive in the Bible. And wine is not just the stuff of everyday drinks. That's what you drink if you want to drink beer. Instead, wine is the stuff of celebration and joy. Not only that, but it's this full of marrow and fatness. All the words for fatty food are cardiologists, who I'm sure will be happy about this. But this isn't just any meal. For a group of people whose diet would have consisted mostly of grains and lentils, and while I love the lentils I make, they aren't quite as good as a steak, even I will admit to that, is that 
This is crazy abundance. This is the stuff of a, of a banquet in which a king establishes his power. And that's what's going on. This is Yahweh Tsebao's coronation banquet. And when a king becomes king, he does a feat of strength, a la Festivus from Seinfeldian fame. And now we get into this feat of strength. Ubala, and he will swallow on this mountain the covering that covers upon all peoples, the covering that covers upon all nations. The word bala here is important. This isn't just any word. Bala actually, and what's probably going on here, is that Isaiah is actually referencing a myth that the people would have known. And it's appropriate since it, after all, is the time of spring that we celebrate Easter. The people had a myth in which good old Mabeth, Mot, the Canaanite god of the dead, every year would get swallowed up, or would swallow, excuse me, would swallow Baal, the Canaanite storm deity. Every year Baal would get swallowed. And every year he would get spit up by death, hence their explanation for spring. The swallower is now Yahweh. And what he removes is this halot. Halot here has a connotation of a funeral pall. It's the shroud that covers. And it's a covering that covers all people. And now we get to the climax in the next verse. Balaha Malveth la nazak and he will swallow death forever. The Old Testament doesn't give us many highlights of the resurrection of the dead. Isaiah 25, Isaiah 26 being two of the big ones, frankly, is that we have this great image of what it means for Yahweh to be king, for our God to be king. What does it mean to proclaim Jesus is Lord? It means that he destroys death forever. And he wipes away all tears, and the Lord Yahweh will Maha will wipe away all tears from upon all faces, and the reproach of his people he will remove. This word reproach, uh, herpa, not typically a word that many of us, especially coming, you know, from most of us as Westerners necessarily care about. Uh, it's one thing to be ashamed. Uh, herpa, the sense of shame for this culture, is actually a fate worse than death. It's this idea of being completely ostracized for one's community. And what Yahweh is doing is removing this and restoring people into a relationship. And then note the punctuation point. Ki Yahweh deber, because Yahweh has spoken. Welcome to a victory banquet in which, in which Yahweh proclaims his victory over death. He establishes his reign by restoring people to relationship and annihilating death. And then we have the only response that reflects a tension that actually exists through much of Isaiah. Varma hayom hahu, I freely admit that I'm enough of a dork to get excited about demonstrative adjectives, and that hahu is a demonstrative adjective. In that day, this expression by yom hahu, connects us to the great day of Yahweh, in which Yahweh vindicates people, namely Christ's first and second advents, one that has already happened and the other one that we as God's people long for. And now note the attention-getting particle, Hane, and we will say, behold, Hane, um, attention-getting, behold, I don't know if I like that word, uh, looky here, probably a little too flippant, Big time attention getting particle. It's an exclamation point. Behold, our, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This passage in Isaiah 25, while looking to Christ's first advent, takes us to Christ's second advent. This Bayom Hahu, this day of Yahweh talk, is looking for that day in which Christ brings all things new. Right now, we are stuck right here. Kavinu. Except, you should probably make it an imperfect. We will wait. We are waiting. By giving us this image of hope after the fact, 
in which death is swallowed up forever, in which, in which all tears have been wiped away from all faces, we get this great picture of what we hope and why we can hope. By fast forwarding to the end, we're able to live our lives in the in-between times, in this time before, between Christ's first and second advents. As you preach this text, there are so many possibilities. And this is a text, frankly, I've preached on Easter Sunday before and absolutely loved it. Because note how you can tie this into Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection that Paul even quotes this passage in 1 Corinthians. By, by referencing Christ's resurrection, we're able to see what it looks like even more. This day that we long for, this feast in which we're in fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. That's the essence of the eating, the eating of the best food and the drinking of wine, that essence of celebration, joy, and peace. And then rejoicing in the victory that's won. Yahweh is king. Our Lord is king. The kingdom of God has come. It has come with the breaking and destruction of death the removal of shame by which we are brought into community and ends with an eschatological longing, longing for that day in which that final verse will be ours. Hene Elohenu zeh kavinu. In that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited low for him and he might save us. Zeh Yahweh kavinu. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. Nagila, let us rejoice and give and rejoice in his salvation. This text preaches gloriously. And I would seriously encourage you to consider connecting this as you preach on Easter Sunday this year, because it gives you a chance to really celebrate the essence and the resurrection joy that is all around us as you get to celebrate Easter with your people. But also keep this text in mind when you're doing funerals as well, because nowhere in the Old Testament do we get quite a wonderful image of hope, of defeat of death, and also that longing that we have until that day in which all tears will be wiped away from all faces. Enjoy this text as we rejoice this blessed Easter time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.